and thank you so much for being here. I'm Deliana Alexander from Filmgate Miami, and I'm here with Paul, who is from XR Miami. Woo! Woo! And together, we created uh, the XR Meetups Miami, which is a free event uh, open to the public, where we tackle the democratization, the demonstration, and the something else, the... Uh, uh, distribution. Distribution, no. And the creation of uh, projects uh, when it comes to XR, AR, interactive and immersive technology. So we are looking at how new tech is influencing the future of storytelling, how it's enhancing traditional storytelling, or just creating a completely new kind of storytelling uh, from now on. Um, what is your goal for this? Uh, Sorry, for this specific or in general? Well, in, general. For, in general is to uh, introduce everyone in Miami, professionals, uh, attendees, uh, the, the opportunity to have access to all these emerging technologies and to bridge the gap between the old formats of film, music, uh, radio of the 20th century and create a new paradigm to be able to connect the physical with the virtual and give everyone a good opportunity to have a better life. Okay. Um, this is good. Um, so all of these meetups actually lead up to a festival at the end of November that happens during Art Basel in Miami and it's called Filmgate Interactive and uh, we scour the earth for the best, inno the most innovative interactive and immersive project um, and we bring 10 to 15 of them here. A couple of them are local and then a lot of them are international. So please keep an eye out for that and uh, come, come play with us because there's some incredible projects that we're bringing uh, to this year's festival. But I don't want to take off on the stage. I know a lot of people ask me about the space and also about what Filmgate Miami does, so I can explain it to you privately after. Um, but I wanted to, without further ado, we're talking about the democratization of technology and innovative technology that's going to it is a game changer, it's going to change the world, make us better as humans, uh, and that's Magic Leap. So uh, without further ado, Lorena Pazmino and Greg Tran are our first guests and uh, they will speak about spatial computing and so much more. So I will let you tell us what that is. So can I raise this, you can guys hear? Okay, great. So thank you guys so much for coming. Really, really excited to be here. Um, as we said, my name is Greg Tron, and this is the extremely talented Lorena Pasmino. Um, we work extremely closely together on the platform design for Magic Leap, and have worked on a lot of principles for designing for mixed reality. And so we work extremely closely together. We're matching tonight. We even got <laughs> matching hats from Dario, Darcio, Dario. And and so you know. We might work a little bit too closely together. Um, but uh, yeah, we're really excited today. We're going to be talking about how to design for mixed reality. We're also going to be um, sort of zooming out and looking at some of the history of the space and uh, what it means for other mediums and new potential mediums. Um, we're also going to uh, sort of talk about some of the learnings and best practices that we've developed and learned from Magic Leap 1. And then also, if you're not familiar with the space, give you a little sense of how you can start to dive in and get more familiar with all of this stuff. So, we also have Callie speaking after us, and she's back there in the pink and blue, so she'll be giving a great uh, talk after us, and so we're super excited to hear that. And there's also a lot of other so-called leapers, magic leapers, uh, from the company in the audience today. If y'all could uh, raise your hand or give a shout out. All of these people, you know, obviously have contributed so much to what we'll be showing today, but you know, this is all a community, and they know many other and different things than us, and so just getting to know each other and uh, reaching out to them is also a great way to do it. And so, um, how many of you guys have tried uh, the Magic Leap One or XR devices? So, we actually have some devices here today, and hopefully we'll be able to demo some of that stuff to you. Um, but. Uh, Lorena will sort of introduce what the Magic Leap One is and, and talk a little bit more about it. And I'll pull one out and I'll model it for y'all. So for those of you that might not be familiar with Magic Leap, we're a startup based here in South Florida and for the past few years we've been working on creating a special computing device uh, which we released last summer along with our own operating system and a set of core applications. 
Mixed reality allows us to break free from the bounds of the screen into a world where computing is more contextual and the digital and physical worlds blend together. For example, Magic Leap Sonami takes advantage of her gesture and spatial audio capabilities to create a truly immersive contextual experience where you can touch, hear, and see everything in your extending your physical space. Um, like you can see right now, like you have like the plants growing out of the tables, out of the uh, out of the couch. If you were to like look up, up to the ceiling, thing plants also kind of grow uh, from the ceiling down. Um, and as you get close to things and you reach out and touch them, um, you get different sounds, and everything is very reacting, uh, creating a really emotional uh, connection with the user and making it feel very immersive. Um, in mixed reality, digital content responds to the world around you and you can engage with objects from any angle and walk around them. For example, as you can see in this video of the Angry, Bird, Angry Birds app, um, things are respecting the physical boundaries and as, as the, sir, the structures break, uh, you can see them bouncing to the floor, things bounce from the table to the floor. And we can show this app and a couple of other ones later here around afterwards. Yeah. So a little bit about me and my background. Um, I come from a very uh, much traditional design uh, background. Uh, I have always been interested in tech. Started taking computer science classes when I was like probably like 15, and then transitioned more into the design side, working the advertising um, side of things, uh, doing a little branding and interactive digital experience, mobile apps. Uh, for brands like Mini, Nike, until uh, Google, as well as like redesigning the Zynga Poker app. Um, and then four years ago, I joined Magic Leap, and alongside Red Tran and some of the other people here, I worked um, setting up the key foundational elements for the operating system. Uh, and then I went along leading the visual design side of it, so setting up the visual design language and leading uh, the group of visual designers, which we grew up, uh, we work as a shared resource, um, supporting the operating system and the set of core applications like Gallery, Helios, uh, Magic World, uh, Capture, uh, what I say? Screens, UV, um, Avatars, and then <coughs> we also support some of our offline properties like uh, developer tools and the mobile companion app. Um, so one of the coolest things about designing for mixed reality and designing in this space is that no one's actually native to this space. So we all come from it from dis different disciplines. So Lorena comes from visual design. I actually come from architecture. And so I, um, I currently lead the design for the platform and the OS at Magic Leap. But I, I started with architecture and mixed reality back in 2009 and worked on how you know, architecture could expand that field as well and what architecture would mean in a sort of mixed reality and digital 3D world. Since then, I've worked on TV, tablet, and phone, and also worked in sort of filmic and digital media techniques. And so, but I did start in mixed reality and architecture, and wanted to show how architects could use this new form of representation for their own work, but also more importantly, what would it mean if you could build with digital content, almost like a construction material, like glass or concrete, what would that imply? And so, you can start to see some representational techniques here. But if you had digital content as a sort of material that is interactive and malleable, how would it exist in a sort of architect's tool palette? And so if we were looking in gla through glasses like this, you can see you put up barriers between spaces. You could potentially see through walls to other locations in the building. You could extend space or sort of play with materiality. And there's many other sort of kit of parts and tools that you could use. Um, and so, not just visual things, but also uh, sort of functional things, of creating new efficiencies for spaces, or showing how people can move around between different spaces, and also giving people different abilities when they move from one part of the building to another. And so, you can see, as I'm sort of showing these things, I'm using a lot of filmic and special effects techniques to do this, right? So, match moving, rotoscoping, tracking, um, these sorts of things. And so when you get into the space, you naturally learn skills from other disciplines, and that's really cool. Now, beyond just the sort of visual techniques and all of this, really wanted to think about 
this medium in a new way? And what does it mean sort of in the, the scope of history, right? And so there's obviously a lot of hype around this space. Um, and uh, there's a lot of jargon, things like AR, MR, VR, XR. And those are sort of arbitrary terms. And so I wanted to think of it as potentially, you know, how does this stuff fit within history in a more, almost the way a, an anthropologist would. Um, so if you look at the course of all human generated content, they fit within these four holistic categories. Material 3D content, things like the stable or the microphone. Material 2D content, things that are written on a page or sort of imprinted on a piece of paper. Digital 2D content, which is obviously like a screen like this or your phone or anything like that. But now a new, totally new category called digital 3D. And right, so these are holistic categories. So anything that is generated by a human fits into one of these things. But interestingly, these were not always around, they were invented and then sort of came about and they were honed by humans. So if we think about it like that, material 3D content, first there were tools, then weapons, eventually more refined things like sculpture and architecture. But this sort of quadrant has been around for 2.6 million years, right? And so you can imagine the vast amount of content that fits within you know, this section. Um, at some point, writing and cave paintings were invented and began to form this second category of the material 2D. The whole history of writing, painting, cartography, print media exists here. Now, currently, we obviously have a lot of digital 2D content on our phones, and anything on a phone or a TV or any screen exists within here. And interestingly, film, video games, interaction design as a medium didn't exist before this category came about 100 to 200 years ago. And so people think that we have digital 3D content already. So, you know, I can rotate a model in Maya or look at a Pixar animation, but it's actually still trapped behind that glass. And so, you know, we talk about it as it's 3D, but it's actually represented still in this way. So the advent of things like the Magic Leap One and other XR devices give way to this brand new category, digital 3D content. And what that implies is that it's digital, you can move around it, it functions almost like a physical object. So if you think about how massive those other categories are, you can imagine, just as we're starting to build this new quadrant, what potentials exist there. And it's not just potentials to create new content, but it's potentials to create entirely new mediums, ways of storytelling, representing content. And the scale of that will be absolutely you know, massive. There's, there's great opportunity for all of us to invent in this new space. So, for clarity's sake, these terms VR, AR, and MR exist within that spectrum. And so VR sort of closes out um, your, device, or your, your world and you can exist in another world. I saw some other people playing Beat Saber and you know, y'all should do that after this too because it's super fun and I'll challenge you. Um, AR that overlays onto space and MR that is blended with space. And you see that little leaper up there, that's what the, the Magic Leap one specializes in. Um, and so with that sort of massive, um, you know, big scope of history in mind. You can imagine how these things obviously will scale to architecture, but also on a city scale, and, and what some of those potentials might be as we move forward. How they can affect uh, how we interact with cities, but also interactive experience and storytelling, uh, and also learning and, and other forms of industry. And so it's super fun, and it, it is fruitful to think about these big scales and, and all of these new potentials. But you know, it's incumbent on us as a company and as people who are working on this right now to say, how can we make the building blocks to get there and what are the things that we do today that can scale, right? And so what we do at Magic Leap is we you know, think about these long-term things, but we also ground it in reality. We try to take the first steps, make those building blocks um, that are tangible and fun and great experiences now. And so Lorraine's gonna talk about what some of those building blocks are. And the first one of those uh, is called the landscape. So as Greg mentioned, there's two uh, foundational elements in the platform, the landscape and the launcher. The landscape is a blank canvas that enables you to have spatially situated content around you. The great thing about this is that the content is persistent, so you can walk to another room, place your content, walk back, and then you can still see the same content that where you left it. You can turn off your device, you can power it back on, and things will be as you left them. Um, this allows for more, uh, for a more, um, 
from our passive intellectual experience, where the real and the digital feel more like an extension of your own space. The launcher brings a familiar paradigm into the world of mixed reality and complements the landscape, allowing you to quickly access your content independent of where you might be. This is also, this is also how you populate the landscape in the first place. Through the launcher, um, you have two applications, uh, two types of applications you can launch. One is immersive apps, which actually hide away all your, hide away your landscape and take over uh, all your digital space. Um, so Dr. G is a great example of that. Um, once you open up with Dr. G, your landscape clears away, and robots overtake your, your environment. Um, landscape apps are built using Magic Leap's uh, Lumen Runtime Application Framework. Oh, I forgot to say, uh, immersive apps, um, you have to use Unity or, or Unreal. Um, where landscape apps, you use it um, using Lumen run Runtime. Um, and the, the great thing about Lumen Runtime is that it allows you to run all these applications in parallel, which enables multitasking. Additionally, mixed reality opens up the opportunity to communicate and feel virtual presence across physical distance, allowing us to have more intimate sense of connection, which is why we wanted to have social and outdoor chat built in as a key part of the platform. But using our sensor, sensors purposefully, users can have an experience of co-presence where they feel generally as if they're sharing the same space and can understand themselves physically from one another they, they can use gestures to fist bump and create like particle effects that come out. Uh, they can high five and have flamingos shooting out of rockets, because <laughs> why not? Um, and they can drag and drop applications if they're in, the, in a call in the landscape. They can just drag and drop applications and share it to somebody that could be in another uh, part of the world. And by using gestures, they can also point at that content, um, enabling a new way of uh, collaboration and sharing that's much more interesting. So as we went designing the platform, we created some core principles for all of us to follow. These are especially useful as shortcuts and key tenants for anyone designing for mixed reality for the first time. We'll cover a couple of them. Um, the first one is the idea of purposeful and conscious design. Mixed reality gives us a wide array of input methods like gesture, eye gaze, Touchpad, six stuff, um, the voice, uh, and new ways of providing feedback for the senses, where visuals work alongside haptics and spatial audio. By designing for the senses, we can choose more meaningfully how to provide feedback and guide the users spatially. For example, if you have content, you have placed content that's behind of the user's field of view, you can use spatial audio to orient them and guide them to where you want them to look. Or let's say by combining haptics, visuals, and audio, you could make something that looks and seemingly hard feel very soft, um, and you can make things feel more tactile and, and create more like um, emotional connections uh, with the user. When designing for mixed reality, we're projecting uh, content right into people's eyes. We're getting more personal than we ever had before. That's why every element placed on the user's direct field of view needs to have a reason to be there. And just because we can do something doesn't mean we always should. More than ever, I think it's really important for everyone that's involved in creating mixed reality experiences to take a pause and think about the, what could be the unintended consequences of the things that we're putting out there. To research, test, and validate all the choices we're making. Like Greg mentioned, this is a new medium and the, the possibilities are huge which gives us a clean slate and an opportunity to look at the past and see how we can design for a better future. To design for the long term beyond trends and novelty. For example, I think one of the first things that come to everyone's mind when you think of mixed reality is all the science fiction movies like Minority Report where you see Tom Cruise just doing gestures all over the place, content all around him. Um, However, if you put that idea into reality, you start seeing that gestures are not the best choices of primary form of input, especially as you're doing productivity-based applications. If you try doing this for a long term, you start feeling fatigued, it gets exhausting. Um, also a challenge in mixed reality is that you don't know where your user might be. They could be in their home alone with a ton of room around them, 
or they could be in a very close space with surrounded by people, um, like a bus or an airplane. Um, they could be sitting, they could be standing. So those are all factors to consider when uh, creating experiences. Additionally, being closely surrounded by a ton of digital content starts to feel very overwhelming because you have just a lot of light projecting in your face. So it's important that we make purposeful design choices and see how we can avoid ending up in something that looks like teaching us this type of reality. Um, this is why I've always actually appreciated how my colleagues, uh, Savannah Niles and James Potterty, approach the design of the input of for our devices, starting by supporting familiar, more accessible and quiet input methods like touch, and then layering on top of it more embodied input methods like sick stuff and gesture. So this gives uh, you as a creator a wide variety of tools at your disposal, and it's about just making sure that you use them in a way that makes sense for the experience you're trying to create, and you think about the user. Similarly, similarly as to how um, not everything needs to be embodied, just because we can do 3D doesn't mean that everything has to be 3D. Planar apps in mixed reality don't necessarily have to be flat. Elements and objects can be layered in Z-depth, creating more dimensional volumetric compositions, making interfaces feel familiar yet innovative. For example, here we have the example where um, you land in your profile within social, uh, you see your avatar, which is the main thing that you want to, we want you to engage with at first, and then on the back, further in space, even though it's not noticeable in this image, it's about 75 millimeters in behind, um, you have a little bit of hint of content that once you swipe to the left, the other thing goes foot backwards uh, and more content is revealed. Um, this taking advantage of like depth is not only authentic to our medium, but also allows us to maximize the amount of content we can display in the user's direct FOV. For the most part, keeping things within the FOV tends to be um, more comfortable, and it's always better to allow the user to go expanding from there and make it more spatial as their own choosing. Um, another factor to always consider is the user's head movement. Um, that's why you will see in a lot of places, like this personalization, you can see that there's always like some sort of anchor in the center. That's what we use to like kind of always guide the user and keep them focused on the elements they need to focus in a way that is comfortable and we avoid giving them next ring. Um, one really good example that came a couple months ago is the Magnifier app where this one thing? Oh there it is. Um, where they take full advantage of depth while using really simple techniques like layering 2D images and 3D space. And, and this enables a new way of storytelling and brings comic books to life. <laughs> so, as Maria said, it's always important to be very purposeful in the things that we design, but we want to be playful and delightful as well. And I think that's a great <clears throat> principle for anyone making content for mixed reality or virtual, rea virtual reality uh, to keep in mind is that we always want to find key moments of wonder because this is a new medium. People really, by design, find it sort of delightful and fun. But adding that extra little touch always really helps. And so we wanted to do that everywhere in our system and figure out how we could do that on our platform. And one of the most prominent places for that is actually when you turn the device on. And for most people, when you turn on the Magic Leap One, it is their first experience with our device, but also their first experience with mixed reality in some cases. And so we wanted to really create a vibrant sort of framework that could be expanded upon, adapt to users, adapt to their space, and also change potentially based on time of year, all, all of these other things. And so if you turn on your device, you know, you would potentially see the Leaper logo up here, and then sort of a world, and all of this content sort of spilling out of it into your space, and potentially feeling contextual to your space. And so, basically, um, you know, you, you feel like the digital world has come and, and sort of joined your space, right? And so, um, maybe it's different in the kitchen than in the living room, and all of that, right? And so, we designed a lot of these different scenes, um, and this is actually the one that we ended up prototyping and building in June of 
beautiful, isn't it? That's my living room, much cleaner than it is in real life. Um, but you'll see it in uh, lots of more stuff. <laughs> um, um, but uh, yeah, this is this is the inspirational image that, that we use to to design the first scene for our startup, and hopefully we'll do more. Um, but Rain and I worked extremely closely together uh, with other people on our team, especially Rod, who's who's here as well, um, in the mill uh, to to get these things turned to life. And you can see we're converting that sketch or that that sort of comp into. Um, sort of real-time assets through Sketch, and then building what the um, actual assets are going to be. And then if you turn on the device, we also worked on what the Magic Leap logo would sort of animate in as, and then when you turn on the device, this is exactly what you see. So the Leaper sort of appears um, and exists within uh, this portal, and all of this sort of interactive, beautiful content comes out. And long-term, what we want is for, you know, the, these animals to fly up to you, fly into your space, and when you reach out, they react to you. And so. As we sort of expand our system, we want those things to feel more alive, feel different, welcome you back every single time you come um, back to the space. And generally, as a principle for mixed reality, having that sort of adaptivity and reactivity is really important. Another sort of moment of wonder that um, we identified on, on a smaller scale is our app icons, right? And so we really wanted to imbue these with, obviously, um, visual beauty, but also meaning. Right? And so if you look at each one of these, they're 3D icons, they're housed within uh, what we call a portal, and we want that portal to be almost like a little glimpse into what the application is gonna be. So you can almost see what's gonna happen ahead of time. And we also have these icons animated to sort of show you more about the app. And so here on the right, we have an example of the social icon, and in its static form, it basically evokes connection, these sort of three dots. But then when you animate it, or when you hover over it, um, you see it's actually interconnected people, right? And so we wanted to have that kind of double meaning um, in detail wherever we could, right? So you can see, obviously we think it's a very, very big scale, but it's important for us to drill down and think at the small scale as well and really bring these things to life. And so even when there are errors or things happen on the device you know, that are unintended, we hopefully have a little bit of a vignette or a nice 3D model that, that sort of softens that and makes it um, less of yeah. <laughs> um, another key principle is clear. Visual clarity of content affects how the brain perceives and processes information. By ensuring that content is always understandable, free from ambiguity, and legible, we can encourage system learning through positive motivation, comprehension, and retention. We also use clear as this double entendre of being clear in the sense of having chromeless interfaces and object integrity, where we can break from the glowing rectangles in our lives and keep the users in the moment while letting content blend with the space. Mixed reality is inherently magical, which means visuals can be captivating yet understated. Light field displays have some unique set of challenges as well. When it comes to legibility, because we're projecting light, and at small sizes, negative space within shapes, like the counters on an A, or like the space between the accent of a, of a letter, um, those start to blend together. And then lines that are too thin start fading away. So this is also something to keep in mind, not just when creating uh, and choosing your fonts, but also when creating graphics and iconography. To maximize legibility, we created our font Lomino UI. We partner with Delta Mac, which is one of the biggest and best type founders there is in the world, um, in order to design a font specifically for Magic Leap One's display. N named after Lorena Pazmino, Lomino. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lomino UI has general, generous amounts of spacing, which allows for great uh, variability at small sizes. Surf curves, though, like you can see on the E. Um, and T um, are, are inviting connecting to Magic Leap's overall design aesthetics. Um, what we wanted to do with the font is was like take the first approach and starting to research where mixed reality typography could go towards. It was first creating something legible, and from there we experimented on how to make things more responsive and more dynamic. For example, when we show titles and Apple options. Um, 
which abortions is a really important menu when you're in the landscape because it allows you to close all the apps and remove digital clutter from your space. So we wanted people to be able to access that, that from far away and keep things at a place where they remain legible. So because of that, we, we, according to the distance between the user and the object, we grow and shrink uh, the content, as well as build boarding it around the app, which makes it visible from any angle. Um, and this is only the beginning for the evolution of typography like, makes reality, which is a, which is I think one of the first times where like we're gonna have a big break and turning point for like what typography is overall. Another challenge specific to mixed reality is that we have no control over a user's environment. It could be light or dark, um, it could be messy and cluttered, or it could be really clean like we show in our comps, but we all know it's never that way. Um, but the main point is that we have no idea. So this makes it a bit harder when we're trying to achieve these chronoless interfaces, um, which is why we created the legibility mask which is a high frequency pattern that you place behind UI to increase, increase contrast and legibility. Um, to do this, we also chose a color that wasn't, that was dark enough to increase the content, that increase the contrast, but also wasn't dark enough uh, to cut holes uh, within the UI. So for example, here you still see another menu and you still see the digital content behind it, it's still visible, it still works. Um, Color, uh, for like, if you guys don't know about like uh, additive color display, uh, the way it works is white is the brightest, more solid that you're gonna get. Um, as you go towards 100% black, it's completely transparent. Um, however, as soon as you surround black by light, you can see it. So that's how you usually achieve uh, eyes and characters. Um, but that also means if you like use a black mask to try to like cover something up and make it disappear, as soon as you put content behind it, it'll show up. So it's always something to um, keep in mind. Um, with that said, as much as it is a challenge to have an unpredictable environment, as the system evolves and we know more about the user surroundings, I think this has great opportunities for storytelling where you can create narratives that feel more contextual, where you can create the mood and the lighting of your scene based on time of day, room, brightness, or color. So one of the other really important principles, um, well, is that for mixed reality, you mix with reality, right? And so we want it to be a blend of the physical and digital, right? And when you combine digital content with physical content, it makes the digital feel uh, like it has more weight and realism. And then when digital or physical content is combined with digital, it adds a sense of magic and almost like it's imbued with something else. And so it's really important to always try to make those things blend. And it starts with being contextual. Right. And one of the interesting things <clears throat> is that there's, there's already contextual storytelling if you think about something like um, the play Sleep No More, other types of site-specific um, performances. You go to a particular location and you can only experience the performance there. And it's non-linear and it's different for each person and it's different each time you experience it. So you can really imagine how something like that could evolve through mixed reality film or gaming to create totally new potentials for a new medium of experience, storytelling, and so forth. So for every art form working in this space, it's really important to consider context. And in UX and UI, we, we sort of look at all these types of context and figure out how can our UIs and our interactions respond to content intelligently, responsibly, and um, you know, the less the user has to do and the more automatic things are, the more delightful they're going to be. And so that's something we really want to continue to work towards. And there's tons and tons of use cases in many different industries of where these things can happen. And so our CEO has said UIs need to become seamless, more and more invisible, and anticipate our needs. And when we have context and understand user intent, our content will feel predictive, available to moments notice, and inextricably tied to our surroundings. 
So one of the really cool things about working at Magic Leap is that there are people from every single art discipline imaginable, all of these. Um, and working in this space, you really blend from discipline to discipline. So obviously, I started in architecture, and through this, I learned motion and film and um, user experience. Um, but <clears throat> it really blends all of these artistic disciplines, and they act, act more like a spectrum. And so, you know, film will be influenced by game design. Fashion will be able to tell stories when you're able to see content coming off of it. Or as you're walking down the street, a performance could happen on demand in a sp specific location. And so, with that in mind, it's really up to us to expand upon these, see what, you know, mediums aren't even on here that will exist from this new um, category. Um, but just like there are many different types of artists uh, in Magic League as a whole and working in the, the medium of mixed reality on our team specifically, um, uh, there's a wide variety of talent and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So within UX, we have seven primary work streams. Uh, the operating system, as I've mentioned before, its input methods, the UI toolkit, core applications, visual design, the developer experience, and user testing. Um, besides that, we also collaborate with other like uh, areas of Magic Leap, like uh, hardware and ID um, for like the design of the, the controller and the input. Uh, we collaborate with the optics for legibility, and we try to do this always. Um, and compassion and advocacy for the experience of the user and the developer. Um, kind of like what Greg was describing is that mixed reality requires uh, teams that are, have like a, a diverse set of backgrounds and have experience in diverse set of disciplines. I think from like UI UX, we all come from like different backgrounds. We've all learned from one another, but also we've all kind of dabbled in a couple of these different uh, kind of areas. Like you have architects like Greg, Amy, and Karen, who are also UI UX designers, and we look at a visual and even prototype. Um, actually, also we built it for 3D. Um, and then you have like prototypers like Rod over there, who's also a technical artist and also can do like 3D. Um, you have more like visual designers like Sarah and Matt and me, who also do UI UX, uh, a little bit of 3D, can also prototype. Um, so it's it's really important to just like learn from other disciplines and keep evolving. Um, so with that said, a lot of the content that we've shown today here, uh, it, it takes a big team to do this. Um, it takes like great leaders like James Flaherty and now Brian Mini, um, prototypers like Rod Cannon, Frank, um, John Austin Day, great visual designers like. Uh, Sarah and 3D artists like Ian and Christina and Kara, interaction artists like Cole, and then the big leads like Karen who leads social, Amy who leads Ubi, and Savannah who now leads social and product. Um, so all of this is just to say, you know, there's a million ways to get into the space. Everyone comes from a different background, and there's a path, no matter where you come from or what your sort of artistic pursuit is, right? And so the, there's some simple things that you can do to get started, and we're more than happy to expand upon these. These are obviously broad. Reach out to us, email us, we'll help you get started. Um, but first, if you haven't tried these things, if you haven't tried an ML1 or you haven't tried um, any of the VR devices, the most important thing to do first is just get exposure. Because we can talk about this, and we can put all this stuff on the screen, but like I said before, this is still digital 2D content. You have to experience it. It's different than you imagine. And that becomes really your reference point for entering this, this world and sort of speaking that language. Second thing is to just expand your skill set. And so here are some of the programs that we use on the bottom. There are many others. But you know, you're not going to be able to do everything. Pick one or two things that you think you can sort of leapfrog to and expand your skill set. And then find partners and prototype with them and interact with them. And this is such a great community. There's obviously people from all different backgrounds here. Uh, a great place to sort of make those connections. And then the last thing is obviously prototype and build. It's good to have, you know, we're talking at a really big scale. It's good to have a really confined project, something you believe in, but is also possible for you to do with a small team. Get it on device, experiencing it. Um, the more you can iterate through 
the headset or through VR, um, the faster you're going to be able to make these things and you're going to be able to iterate and, and really make it uh, excellent. And so, yeah. So with all this said, I think spatial computing is the future of computing. And as creators, we all have the responsibility to help shape this new medium into something that makes the world a better place. A place where we foster connection and belonging as much as we, as much as we foster innovation. A place driven by love and respect for humans instead of trends and sales. Thank you. So, Callie is up next. Woo! Oh, woo! Woo! So, uh, as Callie is coming up, um, and Callie Holderman, and I, I didn't introduce you properly, and I don't think you're actually talking about your background in the beginning, or maybe I missed it. You missed it. I missed it. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> so, I will ask the same thing from Callie when she comes up. Where is Callie? Oh, there she is. Hi. Um, if you don't mind introducing yourself too and talking a little bit about yourself. Um, I do have a question though. There's at least 10 Magic Leap headsets circulating. What are we going to do with them after the talks? I think we could just set them up in some sort of area and people can try a couple of them. Yeah? Okay, cool. So just so you know, if any, anybody hasn't tried the Magic Leap headsets, um, whatever you're listening about right now, we will also have the opportunity to experience after. Just that in mind. Thank you so much. This was really Thank you. Awesome. Um. So um, while Callie's setting herself up, I'll tell you uh, what really impressed me <laughs> when we were talking with each other yeah. um, is the fact that you have a theater and an improv background, not just an engineering background, correct? That is correct. Okay, yeah. so I'll set up. Uh, where's the... Uh, <laughs> something on the HDMI. This is a converter. Okay, so this actually has HDMI. There we go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My eyes are still just working. Um, but I have always had a passion 
for art and technology and really storytelling. Um, so I currently work as the Senior Manager of Developer Experience at Magic Leap. This is my team on launch day. Uh, every single app we have in the store is something my team has touched and helped ship. We help people if they have bugs with getting started, but also advising on the principles that everyone in the company has worked to design and uh, research. We advocate for those and teach those to all of you guys and people around the world. Um, outside of work, I am on the AR, MR, VR committee at SIGGRAPH, uh, the Graphics and Interactive uh, Conference, and uh, I curate a bunch of those technologies into this space. Um, this year, I am in charge of the gaming space. And then I am also the owner and a producer at Endgame's Improv, which is a, uh, a theater and uh, improv venue in San Francisco's Mission District. We have about 1,200 people go through classes every year, and uh, we teach improv comedy and just how to be yourself on stage. So um, I think it's really important uh, in when we're so inundated with technology to get back to our roots as people and learn how to foster that human connection. And that really ties into all the work I do. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how that technology plays into storytelling. Um, immersive technology, um, some of you guys are very experienced in it, but this is really the diving out point for my talk here. Technology that enhances the human sensory experience, uh, whether that's touch, hearing, sight, taste, and smell. And we also have to consider that the people using these technologies aren't often operating at 100% in each of these. So when we design for immersive technologies, we need to make sure the story and the experience is available to everyone, even if they're not you know, hitting at 100% in any phase. I, for one, like I have halos around everything because of my eyes. So additive light technology is always an interesting experience for me. Um, immersive technology goes beyond Magic Leap. Um, projection is actually one of my favorite because it's 3D, but it's also very simple and it really like is enhanced by you know the people being in that space and it, and it plays with our perspective. Um, Internet of Things is what I worked in before I came to Magic Leap, um, and you know like you've been Harry Potter world, you can do like tricks with your wand. This is like a hacker video online. Like, people are making this outside of. Uh, Universal, but there's one called Where's the Rat uh, that I found online too, and it's uh, you can go around and um, in Liverpool and understand like graffiti and an art that's happening in the community just with IoT and connect with the space, which may remind me of one of the walls here. Um, and then that's not loading, um, but uh, traveling while black at a piece from Sundance. Virtual reality is a great tool for immersing us in a different time and space and also putting us in the body of another person and seeing what it's like through their eyes. Um, I believe that successful immersive technology seamlessly blends the natural world with imagination. Um, if you're just using it because it's cool, that's great. It's fun to experiment and play, but really it's, it's, it's coupling both of those that really make it a successful experience. Um, so like they said, Magic Leap is a spatial computing platform. This is our uh, really great photo of it. My picture is I always look like a bug, so we'll use that one. We also touched briefly on this. I would say, this is how I explain it to all of my friends. I'm like, VR is this, and like AR is this. You're translating through a screen. In mixed reality, you're there. We, of course, have our like bubbles today. Um, but where all of these technologies are evolving to become smaller and more natural to our human ergonomic form. Um, so, when should you leverage uh, immersive technology and spatial computing to tell your stories? These are what I think are the three key principles in that. Um, you should use a, a spatial computing. You should never sacrifice these, these three things. And really, this is where spatial computing can strengthen your story in emotional connection, adding interactive elements to your story, and also fostering a connection with either the people, the places, and the things in that story. Um, these are, uh, there are many questions you can ask, but I find these six when you're in that like IE phase are really important when considering using a spatial technology to tell your story. Really, it's just, does this technology serve the story? And that breaks down into these six things. Um, does the technology connect the audience to others? 
since you are in the space, you are with other people, and if it's isolating, like if you think when you're at dinner with someone and everyone's on their phone, it's, it's like it's not fun. Um, make sure you're not, you know, isolating people when you use spatial computing or any immersive technology uh, in your story. Does the technology deepen the audience's connection to your story's time and place? Again, um, this is a way where you can like get uh, like magical realism elements or something to to foster a deeper connection with with the story you're trying to tell. Does it keep your audience engaged? Obviously, if it's boring, there's a lot of like overhead with any technology, and so if it's not worth their time to invest in it, um, it's probably your story served uh, being delivered in another medium or another way. Um, does the experience make full use of the technology and all of its features? Um, if you're just using Magic Leap to show a screen, probably use a projector, guys. It's a lot cheaper. Um, make sure you're using all of the, the, like, the riches and depth that the technology has to offer and challenge yourself and work with other collaborators who you know, may be able to bring those elements to life in a richer way. Um, does the technology compel people to return? This is a big one. Uh, for storytelling, a lot of times we, we see a story, it resonates with us, but we don't, we don't re-watch every film we've seen. Um, adding a uh, like spatial computing, a Magic Leap uh, experience, or any immersive experience is something people might come back to. Greg mentioned Sleep No More, that's like a non-linear story, so every time you go back, you'll get to experience different things. And this is something where if you don't have a giant hotel to build out, um, you know, you can use uh, mixed reality to uh, add those elements in um, without having the real estate. And then, does the technology advance the dialogue after the experience is over? Um, like, trends and sales aside, there really has to be, you know, an emotional connection or something compelling um, that people want to talk about. So, um, really, it comes down to deepening your audience's connection with the story and to each other. So let's talk about just a few ways. There are so many, but um, I wanted to just touch on a few here. So audio, which uh, Lorena mentioned before, connects to a story's time and place. So imagine if you're watching a Western film, and when uh, you know, like the bandits come up and they come on their horse and they like surround you. If you have spatial elements in your piece, so you actually hear the horse's footsteps and they're like breathing behind you. These are things you can do with our platform and um, just using our APIs add the sound into your experience and into your film. Um, the next one is connecting to others. So uh, if you're like me, you've moved a lot and uh, a lot of your friends are all over the world. Um, so one of the things that I always like to do is just like experience that story with my friends with other people. You can use things like uh, the social app that they were speaking to to bring people into that space and just have a dialogue with someone who's away, but you're not like video chatting, you know, their avatars are there, they're watching that with you. Uh, when they turn, like I just did to the screen, you know, their avatar turns. And this is just the first step of what we're doing with Magic Leap and, and social. So that's going to continue to evolve and just deepen uh, how we connect to each other and our communities. Um, and then this one is cool, but a little more complicated. So live interaction with digital characters. Um, thinking about theater, there is a lot of opportunity in um, you know, facial capture, motion capture. You can have an actor backstage embodying a digital character and bring that to stage with real actors and have your audience see all of that that is possible with our technology. Um, and of course, like partnering with uh, motion capture suits and everything else. But this is really, um, you know, it's not anymore just like a scripted character that you're playing through or projection that's like, okay, uh, if you think about um, the rides uh, like in, in Universal, you go through and you're standing in line. And if you don't get through long enough, the same like holograms and story plays again. Um, this way you could have a live actor in there and they could address, you know, people welcoming, you could have, uh, your, your actors and your talent, um, not only with the people who are experiencing the film, but engaging with the, the audience before and after the film in this way. Um, and then a lot of this is really cool, you, but the thing is, um, like Greg mentioned, this is a really emerging space. So there isn't a ton of content today to, um, to build off of and remix and be inspired by. 
So we need to look beyond film and games for inspiration. Uh, get out there, see what art is in your community. I feel like I don't have to tell you guys because you guys are here. Um, but even like traditional things like pop-up books, these are really amazing and libraries often have like book binding uh, like weeks and they'll just bring a bunch of books like this out and curate um, really interesting uh, way to see how 3D is coming out in a more traditional medium. Um, dance and just movement is always really inspiring and board games, like anything where people are interacting, uh, look, look at what works there and what doesn't and think about how you can apply that in a digital medium. Um, these are two pitfalls that bother me a lot, but there's more. Um, balancing your audience's attention. Uh, so sometimes things can be really uh, compelling, but it's, it's passive. So people, um, this is really about interaction design. If it's you're just making them sit through it or it's you're onboarding them to something, it has to be fun and compelling. Uh, but the opposite is true where if there is so much interaction, uh, everyone is distracted and people are, like they lose touch with where they are and who they are with. Um, both disconnect you from the human experience and um, it is achieving the right balance between interaction and, uh, and engagement with that story. So it's like prototype and, and play out with the interactions before you, you, know, you polish everything because um, you know, it's time consuming to do these things, but if you get it wrong, you can tell by the end and um, it isn't fun to waste weeks on the wrong decision. Um, and then making interactive moments accessible, like I said at the beginning, not everyone who goes through that experience is going to potentially have strengths in all five senses. People are gonna be from different backgrounds, different ages, different heights and body shapes. Um, so not all the interactive moments will be accessible to them. So give them context clues, whether that's visual. Um, I think the audio on our platform is just amazing, so I'm always advocating for that. But uh, it serves as a guide to let people know where to go, um, and it always encourage discovery uh, when, you're, when you're using this technology, and reward them for even like small things, because there isn't necessarily like a right way to engage with this content now. It's about making it fun, and it's about making people connect with each other and want to come back. Um, so uh, briefly, how do I do that? Uh, if you um, enjoy these talks and like the demos, you might want to check out our tools and resources. So if you want to talk to my team, uh, you can find us all at creator.magicleap.com. This is our creator portal, and uh, we have a developer forum. It's under discuss right now. Um, but you, if you have any questions with getting started, or you're like, what did we say in that talk? We just ask us a question there. We address every single question that comes up uh, through that portal um, Monday through Friday, though. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's okay. There's a lot of questions up there. You can probably search and find the answer. Um, there's guides, there's tutorials, there's examples for how to do this. Um, and there's a whole creator community out there who, beyond just me and my team, who are willing to support you. Um, this is our software ecosystem. So um, like Lorena mentioned, Lumen Runtime is the, the native engine that we developed. It's uh, C++, but also MagicScript is wrapping that with JavaScript. So you can use that if you're from a web background. We also use Unreal and Unity's engines, and Helio is our web browser. So again, if you want to uh, create a website and have those 3D elements pull out of the page, either you know that layered design like Lorraine was speaking to, or have a character come out or a model of a car, uh, you can just do that through the web. Um, LuminOS, we spoke about that a lot, and we have a bunch of cloud services. We have an app store and um, persistence, so being able to share your space with other users in the world. That's a lot about how we um, do multi-user experiences. The simulator is a really big part of this, which I don't think I have a slide for. But you can go onto the creator portal today and download our SDK. And just like if you've done any mobile development, you know there's a little window that says, hey, this is what it will look like on the phone. Uh, we have that uh, for Magic Leap. So it will show you a simulated room and you can create your content and start playing around with it without having the headset. This is like a weekend getting up and started project or an evening, depending 
it would take me like maybe a Saturday. Um, but these three, you can do that in our in our simulator today. So check check that out and download our SDK and give it a go. Um, these are our APIs uh, at a high high level. So the, a lot of our inputs, uh, Magic Leap has a lot of them. You'll get to try them uh, in the demos. Head pose, where is the user position? Gestures, hand tracking, image tracking, being able to like recognize objects. Eye tracking, blinking, where is the user looking and where are they paying attention? Spatialized audio, uh, built-in speakers, but also um, capturing input through the microphone. Um, multimedia, you can capture what you're seeing and share it with people. And then world reconstruction, um, that's what we call meshing, which creates the geometry of your space and um, represents the real world environment. So uh, the namespace, the like magic leap, uh, we have the same namespace for everything. Um, and that's how you recognize in Unity, like what is our APIs versus Unity's APIs. Um, it follows the typical patterns of like you have to start and stop uh, those events. And um, also worth mentioning, the camera and spatialized audio and luminance don't work in the simulator because the camera is like, and all of those things are feeding in from the device. So you won't see those in the simulator because like Greg said, it's you're still stuck behind the 2D screen. Um, and then when you are creating an app, you have to enable privileges for some of those APIs. We cover that all on the learn portal, so I won't go into too much of that here. So spatial mapper, world reconstruction, this is the basics here. You uh, you will, this picture here kind of shows you the best, but you'll, you'll mesh your environment. Um, you don't need to do, the device is always uh, collecting this input, but um, like in the game, Dr. G, you know, they, they mesh the space and, and you go. Um, and like where create does like what we call a scan and bake. So you can scan and mesh the environment and then turn that off and this can like save you uh, compute power on the device. But like how this table is recognized here, objects will actually be occluded behind that once uh, you have your meshing phase done. Planes is another way to pretty much uh, get environmental input. Um, and you can query those and kind of see like, hey, what are, where are my tables, where are my walls? Uh, we have the controller um, and we have touchpad in there, like a little scroll at the top, and also inputs for all of the buttons. There's LED and haptic feedback, which we also expose to our developers. So if you want that to like rumble or shake, that is available to you. Um, ray casting. So um, this is, you know, you're physically ray casting from either your head or the control to objects out in the environment. Um, eye tracking has its own uh, casting system, but it's, uh, it's it really, in an abstract way, is parallel to what you do, um, you know, with ray casting and engines today. But again, it's from it's from where the user is, which is what's uh, different here. Hand gestures, we have eight of them. Um, one of the recommendations we say is to have a couple like it's detected every frame, so you're gonna want a couple frames just so. Uh, if you're calling start, you know, there's time to get that recognized in case there's any performance issues. Um, and even once you have gestures enabled, there is a gesture for like no hand or no gesture. So you'll always get some um, gesture uh, feedback, even if you're like not doing one of those eight gestures. And in 20, we just got, we were only used to detect the back of the hand, but now we detect the front. So we have a large team working on improving this. Um, and part of that is key points. So right now we have these ones enabled and um, you can, again, like kind of recast from those points or do intersections to say like if someone's touching something. Um, that's really like if you guys try to navigate a lot of uh, how the app knows things are, are touched and recognized, um, people interacting with that content. Eye tracking, um, calibration is something you have to do. Uh, each person does that for their device and that ensures like the best experience but also makes eye tracking uh, work really well. Fixation point is where people are like looking and holding um, contact with that object. And um, we also have APIs for blinking and eye centers so you can um, raycast through like the fixation point 
and kind of see, let people select stuff uh, using our ID API. Um, image tracking, uh, we get this question a lot, but we currently, uh, you can't use this for QR codes or our code markers. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so you can use it, the contrast of the um, image is still more important than color, so that's something to keep in mind when selecting what images you're using for image tracking. Um, spatial audio, we've talked about this a lot. It's called MSA in our APIs, so if you're like, where is it, I can't find it, that. Um, but it's, uh, you can set the source in the listener, so you're again just uh, setting a source, I'm like, hey, the audio is coming from this horse, and then um, set different listeners to change how that audio is experienced in your content. Um, and the camera and microphone, this a lot of people are using, and there's a lot of other um, like SDKs out there that you can integrate with. So if you want to do voice to text, um, or if you want to get a raw feed of the camera, um, you can get pixel layout information and then process that like separately to you know do what you will. So this is actually one of our uh, like in terms of getting data and information on the device, one of the best ways I think uh, that we make that available. Um, and if you want to follow other Magic Leap developers, we have a Twitter handle, Magic Leap Devs. Um, and this is a hashtag, and we are always really love to see your experiments and what you're creating. So please share that with us online. Um, get in touch. And um, yeah, and that's me personally. So you can reach out to me there too. Um, thank you so much for having all of us here. but I wanted to call out also Greg and Lorena in the front. So if it's the three of you, that's okay. <coughs> and then uh, I'll moderate a little bit, but just raise your hand and I'll point out. Do you want, let me give you some chairs. Oh uh, yeah, sure. You guys can pull it, if you want, you can pull this little one. <laughs> It'll be easier. Yeah, that's true. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, well, Holly Holliver is so with H-O-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-E-R-H-O-L-
that said, we do have a lot of, like we have, uh, you know, there's a hello world for like every single other thing. We have hello cube um, because we're 3D. So you can, you can go through that tutorial and there's step-by-step -step guidance and there's video there. And then we will work with you. Um, there's some people that ask us questions every single day and we like, you know, we get to know them very well. So we do it in a like one-to-many way so that we can um, provide those answers to our entire community. Um, but that is, uh, that is what is available today. And I think a follow-up kind of question, I'll go to you. A follow-up question from that, and you outline, you outline all of the software that maybe we should know in order to create within the space, but what is the easiest entry in order to create within the Magic Leap universe? Sure. Um, so most of our developers today are using um, our, our engines that you know, we partner with, Unity or Unreal. So whichever of those you're most familiar with, there's a lot of resources beyond just Magic Leap um, to get started in Unity or Unreal. And um, that is, I would recommend either of those as a jumping off point. And then, um, especially if you're new to programming, uh, that's a good way to jump in. And then, um, like we said, we have room in runtime, which, is, which lets you create those, uh, I was gonna confused, landscape apps so you can run multiple at the same time. Um, so go like build your first thing in prototype in Unity or Unreal, and then when you're ready to put you know multiple experiences in the space, give it a try on the run time. And uh, yeah, we're here to do questions. Um, so I think the go behind the Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering. I mean, uh, are you looking for people with visual talent or writing scripts? And of course, writing scripts for this would be a very different format. Mm -hmm. So do you have any examples of that? Uh, online or I mean I can imagine how you can do it you know like visual and dialogue and scenes and all that but how do you go, go about writing a script as a team are you talking about like a narrative script yeah. or mm -hmm. yeah, I'm gonna turn it over game or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean we're we the personally, music, the dialogues, the visuals. Yeah, so so we're focused more on enabling people and creators to do those things. And so I feel like this is a perfect community to um, to start to build these experiences. And it's our job to enable you to do that, right? And so, um, like, for instance, I don't program, right? I, I, I can't, I'm not an engineer, right? But I'm a visual person, I'm an artist. And so I make a lot of that 3D content myself, and I partner with engineers so that we can build that content together, try it out on the device. And what we're looking for, obviously, as a company, are these types of creative people who have a vision to create something. And it's our job to enable that, right? And so, um, you know, as we were trying to emphasize, not that it takes a village, that's a child, but um, <laughs> it, takes, it takes multiple people to, to, to build this. You know, we don't all have uh, those skills, and so um, it's best to find people who can program in Unity, or you know, being able to, to write is a, certainly a big part of that as well. Um, so, forming a small team, uh, reaching out to communities like this and other sort of XR communities is a really good start. And then, you know, we'll do our best to, to enable all of you uh, and point you to the right resources. And I think if you're just concept, then you can still use a lot of the tools that you've already used. Like you use After Effects, you can use uh, always using some sort of like 3D tool like Cine 4D. It's a bit easier for like getting your kind of like feet wet. Maya is obviously like the better choice, but like for me, for example, I learned Cine 4D. It allows me to do what I want to do really quickly. Get my concepts uh, to a point that I can show it to people. Kind of get my ideas across, and then. From that point on, you can get with developers and actually build yeah. it. So you can still use some of the, the, the tools that are available from like before, and we know we're all familiar. Uh, just kind of like what Greg was showing with his thesis, right? He's rubber scoping, and then just create those concepts and then build them out as well, if if that helps you uh, get running. Right, and it it depends on what kind of format you're trying to show this stuff, right? So uh, for for Obvious reasons, you know, not everyone can be wearing the device at once, and so oftentimes showing things through special effects or um, storyboards or things like that can be a really good way to have an impact. Uh, in front? 
the API that you have, are they open source or are they just um, the stuff that you put there for people to use? <coughs> yeah, so today they are, they're not open source, they're just, um, they're exposing, uh, you know, access to our proprietary operating system. Um, you're welcome to build open source things. <laughs> Um, I work at an educational institution, and uh, that's kind of part of our purpose here is to do some fact-finding. What do you guys think is the future as far as that area, educational uses of XR and the VR technology? Where do you think it's going? I guess we can each answer shortly. Yeah, so um, I think one of the it opens a lot of doors for education in that it's uh, it's uh, similar to like Google Cardboard, you know, you, you're, you're taking the students and you're, you're bringing that enrichment into the classroom without having to, you know, buy a thousand frogs for dissection. You can just run the same app over and over again. So it brings uh, opportunity to a lot of uh, schools, a lot of students that may, uh, you know, beyond just the investment in the technology, not have that. And it opens opportunities for collaboration between uh, different institutions. Yeah, we also talk about, I, I sort of touched on this, but one of the most powerful ways to, to educate people through mixed reality is through context. If there is a particular device or machine or, and, and I know you're probably talking about uh, not in industry education, but that's, uh, you know, you can see how it could apply to multiple things. Um, leveraging context and sort of showing how things fit together or what you're supposed to do, that's something that is a universal mixed reality use case that I think is one of the most powerful things that we can do because you know, it brings intel intelligence exactly to where you are. Um, and yeah. No, but that brings up a really good point because I, I often think as I'm entering uh, the different technologies and, and realizing that I'm pretty much done with educational and state, you know, um, what I would have loved to have as a technology in order to learn, for example, physics or chemistry, you know, like there's a certain subjects that would have been so incredible to learn through this technology that I envy the kids these days or that you know the generation that comes next so. yeah and there's a lot of hands-on things yeah. things that you can visualize that you wouldn't have access to normally i think there's a great opportunity in that i think there's also something to be said just for the exposure factor right and, and so you know exposing kids or, or anyone generally to these mediums will mean that they and you know, everyone here basically has a head start on everyone else for when they become more ubiquitous which inevitably they will okay. thank you yeah, I think uh, in that sense, in uh, education, I'm very interested in, in the field as well. And uh, I think the, the, the main, uh, let's say, shift that's going to happen with this is that it's experiential learning instead of cathedratical learning. And how you assimilate information in this device is just like very intuitive and the information sticks with you in what Diliano was saying. You know, like physics, you can understand concepts. Uh, right then and there because we're three-dimensional beings inhabiting a three-dimensional world and this is the first time that this three-dimensional content comes to life so it's very powerful. Uh, there was a question there and a question there and a question there. Okay. Well, did you not have a question? No. Uh, oh, behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I had two uh, questions. One was um, what you named a lot of different fields that you pull from as far as uh, design and uh, artistic fields that come from. Are there fields that you kind of were surprised to have to pull from or that, that you uh, learned a lot from that you didn't expect to happen? And then also, um, as a, I'm a designer as well, and I was just wondering, what are one of the biggest challenges for moving from 2D to 3D um, and dealing with more special computing? So I, I think there are probably a lot of different answers to that. And yeah. um, I feel a little bit uh, naive in saying this, but I came, I, I went from architecture, I didn't even think I was going to do interaction design, and I went into mixed reality, right, and so I, I just sort of stumbled into that, right, and one thing that I didn't, which I would have known at the time, is that I should have been thinking more about game design and processes in game design and real-time 3D, because 
uh, in many ways, that's the thing that is not, not the closest to mixed reality, but the tools transfer over extremely well because you know it is running on a smaller uh, sort of compute pack, um, and it's also right. Like I learned how to do 3D through uh, architecture programs, Rhino, and it's very heavy, right? And so these guys always optimize their assets; they do it the right way, and, and those things really transfer. So in terms of technical things, I think that is something that I wish I would have been sort of more in tune with at the time, and so I think that's one of the most, maybe it's not surprising to a lot of people, but I think that's certainly a discipline that informs a lot of the things that we do. Um, and I, I, think, I think it is probably surprising to people that architecture um, could be related to this space, but you know, it is going to be, and it, it, it's, uh, you know, we often think of, of sort of augmented reality content as almost like a sculpture in the space, but as we're expanding upon it, we, we really see it as being tied to spaces, activated when you move through spaces and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, do you have any other thoughts? I think for me it was also like just putting the device, uh, learning how to get just like, for example, Unity. It's a very like, quick and simple way of like getting content on the device and starting to experiment with that, learning some sort of like 3D software. Uh, that's why I mentioned like Signal for the it's really easy to get up and going and get something that looks okay and nice and then you can put it on the device and start testing but just the more that you experience things on the device the more you learn because sometimes you you think you have a great design and then you like test it and you're like eh, that was completely wrong or sometimes you're like yeah maybe that could that's not gonna work and then you test it and you're like wow that actually like worked so the more you actually like prototype and like invest time like wearing the device i think it's super helpful um and then, again, I think it's like if you just think about traditional uh, design, you always have to think about balance, hierarchy, and all that stuff. Uh, like I was saying before, just depth. Depth is a, it, it brings a new way of hierarchy, and that, that actually like, makes things like, way more immersive. It makes things feel better. You can like, really like, guide the user through your interface by using depth and placing the content that's like, most important closer to the user and then moving everything back. That way everything feels responsive, legible, but then you you take advantage and expand kind of like the campus, it's like stop like being close to that like boundary. Uh, I forget exactly what the question was, but it was about moving from 2D to 3D. I think uh, Lorraine touched on this, the Madefire app on our device is really, really cool because it's sort of trying to change what comic books are, right? But they're not doing with all 3D assets, it's just 2D PNGs, they layer them. When you see it and experience it, it it's truly different and it's fun to interact with and it doesn't require, you know, having learned Maya in full, but it, it does feel authentic and specific to the medium. And I think there are, you know, all of those types of opportunities to um, invent and be um, sort of ingenious with some of the skills that you already know. And just as a, a general artist or someone who sketches or paints or something like that, even just getting your hands on things like Create or Tilt Brush and making things and sketching will give you a sense of, of how to start building the space and then you can move into more through complex stuff from there. I'm just going to pick it back on that and I'm going to add all that there's a lot of questions. But um, so I remember Felipe showed me a New York Times article that was a magic leap and I was thinking how that will revolutionize how we even experience the news, right? And and it was still kind of 2D, uh, 2D the way it was designed, but it was still moving through space and it was just so much more interesting to read an article and play the video and, and see the graphs in 3D and kind of experience the story as opposed to reading about the story. And I know we've been talking about empathy and, and why augmented reality and virtual reality are changing the way we experience um, well, stories and, and humans. And it's taking us away from being desens desensitized as humans to the point of actually feeling and experiencing again, and that's really exciting uh, in journalism, gaming, immersive theater, etc. Anyway, so I had to just say that. Uh, but okay, go. Um, do you think it'll, or is it possible now, or will it be possible to be able to create in Cinema 4D using the Magic Leap headset, like, uh, like, while create in 3D space uh, while immersed in 3D space? Oh, you mean like? 
a plug-in for Cinema 3D. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think they're, they're all, yeah, I mean, you can't <laughs> There are, um, I can't think of the names of some of these things, but um, I've seen examples of, of uh, some sort of cinematic uh, programs in, in VR that, that do the types of tool things like that. And, well, not just tilt brush in terms of creating uh, content, but also sort of filmic techniques. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you could set up a scene, and then you could say, "Here's my camera, and I can move it through this, my sp through space with my hand, and say this is frame one, this is frame 200, or whatever." Yeah. And so, those things are really, really interesting. So, obviously, you know, we're not building them directly right now, but certainly there are people that are doing that. And, uh, yeah, our partners are working on that, and just other creators in the space are, you know, uh, businesses who create those tools are always looking for what technology is next, where do people want to use those tools. So yeah, VR, AR, MR headsets, they're exploring those spaces and uh, we're eager to partner with them because like you guys have said, like we said, you know, being in the space and creating, that's how you understand. You can't be trapped in this 2D space and understand in real time how that experience will play out. So well, not today, but soon. <laughs> this stage is famous. This is the first uh, augmented reality short film uh, Deliana helped us with this for the Miami Science Fiction short. James Powell is our speaker also. So the first AR short film was on this uh, this stage. And some of those techniques and tools you described. That literally, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 sitting, you're sitting where like a car was like zipping through an AR through some someone for a naked that. angel after. Go ahead. So I have a question uh, in regards to. It looks like when you came on, you were saying you set up an avatar and then there was some kind of a social app where you could hang out with your friends. Um, so I'm wondering about is there any kind of push or in that avatar creation process or a secondary market or anything is there like digital fashions like where you can have like oh you know I make the necklace that you wear or oh the wall art that you have that's interactive like kind of like the almost just like the environment creation that you set up like I imagine if you're gonna hang out with your friends you want it to be your own space like so is that something you guys already have available down the pipeline or just your creators will create that maybe in the future? Yeah, I think the, the Lumen Runtime, the um, the land, what we call landscape applications are perfect for that because it can just be, you know, a picture frame or it can be a sculpture in, in your space, but I'll, I'll pass this over and I'll speak about it. <laughs> I mean, through the personalization app, you can uh, customize your avatar and then you can pick different accessories. Uh, we don't have any partnerships yet of developing more accessories that are like branded or things like that, but um, I mean, I also can't talk about <laughs> that part either. Um, if Savannah was here, maybe she could. <laughs> she's here somewhere. Um, okay, one last question, and then we'll play with the Magic Leap headsets, because it's getting quite, you know, I don't want to keep you for Okay, go ahead. So, like, you talked about uh, JavaScript, like, use cases, and mm -hmm. I think there was two bullet points. So, like, last night, we had a, uh, a, a game developer meetup, and we, we made JavaScript games. So one of them was, uh, Angry Birds, and I saw, obviously, Angry Birds. So if we did a part two, like making Angry Birds JavaScript, like, and we, how would we integrate Magic Leap into part two of that, uh, of that uh, meetup? So uh, we, Magic Script is a JavaScript wrapper for our Lumen runtime uh, platform. So what that does is it just gives you uh, in JavaScript access to those APIs that are available on our platform. Um, a lot of the other things that you've already created in those JavaScript games, you'll have to use those as well. It's just to say like, hey, I want to connect when you, you know, flame, uh, you know, it's a pig. The, I always get the animals confused. The bird. Yeah, yeah. You the, the bird. The bird. I the think the bird, the bird at the pig. It's so confused. Um, the round things, the round animals each other you know they like that interaction with the control you'll have to use our API which is wrapped in JavaScript to get that interaction instead of like your keyboard or whatever um, that you're using today because I saw like I saw the two bullet points like the magic trips was under the the very bottom with no emulator but also as a as a uh, platform mm -hmm. so you can do a game as a platform is that what you're saying or and the very last bullet you had but you had you had the Helios browser for JavaScript, and then yeah. the Magic Script is that is that part of that or is that part no, of the platform? No, so it's it's separate. These are just like uh, okay. and 
not all of them are full-fledged engines. For example, Helio is one of our core applications. It's not it's not the same as like Unreal, which is a game engine, a 3D engine. Um, so platforms is what we are loosely saying as an umbrella term for all of the ways that you can like you, these are tools available to you to create content on our device. And depending on your background or like what you're trying to create, you'll find that there's you know certain advantages to what you're trying to do. So in the case of your the game devs meetup where you guys are already familiar with JavaScript, I think jumping into Magic Script first is probably that's the best jumping off point. That's a good point because ironically we're the official Unity 3D user group but we do our beginner courses in JavaScript because that's what people in Miami know, so. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever works. Yeah. On that note, you have thank been talking for a really long time, so thank you so much. <laughs>